Hey everyone, welcome back to the Commander Table, Dennis here. Today we're going to talk about my Fire Song and Sunspeaker deck, and the challenges that come with building a Boros deck in Commander. White Red decks face a huge disadvantage in Commander because their access to card draw and mana ramp is extremely limited when compared to the other colors. With this deck, we'll be clawing and scratching for every bit of card advantage and mana we can get. Let's take a look at our Commander. Fire Song and Sunspeaker is a 6 mana 4 6 with 2 abilities. It gives our red instants and sorceries lifelink, and whenever a white instant or sorcery spell we control gains us life, the Minotaur pair will deal 3 damage to something. Don't get me wrong, that second ability can be helpful, but it's the first ability that really takes the cake. Imagine a game where we control Fire Song and Sunspeaker in 6 lands, and each of our 3 opponents controls 3 creatures. We cast a Rolling Earthquake for 5. It will deal 5 damage to each of the 10 creatures on the board, and 5 to each of the 4 players. That's 70 damage in all. Subtract the 5 that we deal to ourselves, and this Rolling Earthquake will effectively gain us 65 life. And this is a modest scenario. I've played many games where there are 15, 20 creatures on the battlefield when I've cast Star of Extinction and gained hundreds of life. Unfortunately, while gaining that much life is certainly cool, it doesn't actually win us the game. We need a way to use our absurdly high life total. That brings us to our first win condition, Aetherflux Reservoir. Since its release in Kaladesh, it's become the default win condition of commander decks that gain a lot of life, be it Firesong and Sunspeaker, Aloro, or Tristani Celestia's Voice, and for good reason. It can win you the game the same turn you cast it, which can't be said for the other contenders for this role, Test of Endurance and Philidar Sovereign. Our other win condition in this deck is this card, Repercussion. It's a 3 mana red enchantment that reads, whenever a creature is dealt damage, Repercussion deals that much damage to that creature's controller. With Repercussion in our deck, it's important to be able to manage the number of creatures we control when we cast a big damage based board wipe. And we're also going to want to add effects to our deck that can give our opponents some creatures in case they don't play many on their own. I want to present you with this deck's win cons first because they provide clarity to my deck building choices. If we want to win commander games with a Boros deck, we need to have a very clear goal in mind and focus all of our resources towards that goal. Building and playing with Fire Song and Sunspeaker has been an uphill battle and filled with difficult choices. I've found the challenge to be gratifying, and it's my hope that in this video, I'll be able to share with you that feeling. Alright, ready to fight the good fight? Let's go. As you might imagine, pretty much all of this deck's ramp is artifact based. Soul Ring, Wayfarer's Bauble, Mindstone, Boros Signet, Worn Power Stone, Palladium Mirror, Commander Sphere, Hedron Archive, Grand Dynamo, and Gilded Lotus are all pretty standard options. Treasure Map technically ramps us after it flips, though it's earned its spot more due to its card filtering and card drawing capabilities. Neheb the Eternal usually acts as a Gilded Lotus on a stick, attacking and netting us some extra mana on our post-combat main phase. But on the rare occasion when we have two earthquake type effects in our hand, he can facilitate some explosive plays. Treasonous Ogre is a very powerful card in this deck, and one of the few ways we can exploit our high life total. And finally, Smothering Tithe, fresh from Ravnica Allegiance, provides us with a constant stream of treasure tokens. We have a lot of different card draw engines running in parallel in this deck. And as it's a toolbox deck, it's important to keep track of what pieces each engine requires. If we draw Well of Lost Dreams or Dawn of Hope, for instance, we should be looking to cast and protect our commander, as it's our main source of life gain. If we draw Skull Clamp, we should value our token producers more highly. If we draw Mind's Eye, we should try to maximize our mana production. Not that we wouldn't anyway. Whatever. Quick side note. Mind's Eye and Smothering Tithe work really well together. For each card your opponent draws, unless they pay two, you get a treasure that you can immediately sack to draw a card. But they still pale in comparison to, say, Consecrated Sphinx. The sheer disparity in power level here demonstrates why Boros is at such a disadvantage in Commander. We combine a 4 mana enchantment with a 5 mana artifact to create one of the strongest draw engines available to the color pair and it's still only half as good as a single 6 mana blue creature. But I digress. Treasure Map and Trading Post are two other quasi card draw engines that also work well with Smothering Tithe, in addition to providing some other utility. I also run Staff of Bin, 
which I run in this deck over the Immortal Sun because A, I have a couple of Planeswalkers in this deck, B, the Sun's Creature Anthem effect prevents us from clamping our own creature tokens, and C, Staff of Thin's pinging ability can actually help us clear our own board of one toughness creatures when there's a repercussion on the battlefield. Land tax will get us extra cards in our hand, and yes, they might only be basic lands, but getting three every turn will both thin out our deck and give us discard fodder for the rummaging effects of Goretti, Scrap Savant, and Nihiri the Harbinger, which are the two planeswalkers I alluded to. Alhammerit's Archive is a recent addition, so I haven't actually tried it yet in a game, but I think it's a promising addition. And finally, we have Outpost Siege, which doesn't have any of the fancy synergies with any of the cards in the deck, it's just one of the best card advantage engines Red has access to. So that's a lot of different ways to get more cards into our hand, and it should be enough that in most games by turn 5 or 6 we are seeing at least more than one new card each rotation of the table, which is good. But as the game goes longer and longer, decks with access to cards like Consecrated Sphinx and Rhystic Study are going to outpace us. They will simply be able to draw more cards than us. We need to end the game before they can shut us out with a critical mass of counter magic and point removal. And whether we are going for the Aetherflux or Repercussion Kill, to end the game, we're going to need a damage-based board wipe. It might be tempting to pack your Firesong and Sunspeaker deck to the gills with Earthquake-type cards due to their inherent synergy with the commander, but you'll find as you play the deck that you'll usually only need to cast one big board wipe in the course of the game, and until the time comes when you need one, you don't want them clogging up your hand. I only run five board wipes in my deck, and they can be divided into two types, traditional Earthquake variants which deal damage to both creatures and players, and board wipes that only deal damage to creatures. Of the first category, I play Rolling Earthquake and Molten Disaster. Note that with the Dominaria rule changes, you can no longer redirect the damage from these to Planeswalkers your opponents control. Of the second category, we have Blasphemous Act, Chain Reaction, and Star of Extinction. It's these cards that really maximize our potential life gain. There are other options you can use in these slots if you want to build your deck without Planeswalkers or, say, don't want to pay $10 for a Rolling Earthquake when Starstorm costs, like, 50 cents. I wouldn't blame you in the slightest. As I mentioned earlier, we're including a couple ways to give our opponents creatures so we can both gain more life with our board wipes and deal more damage with repercussion. I've tried several different cards that do this, namely Goblin Spymaster, a Crowan Horse, and Genesis Chamber but have settled on Forbidden Orchard, Benevolent Offering, and Barchild's War Riders. If you're unfamiliar with that last one, I don't blame you for that either. Barchild's War Riders is a 2-mana 3-4 creature with Trample, Rampage 1, which means that whenever the War Riders are blocked by more than one creature, they get plus 1 plus 1 for each creature blocking it beyond the first, and if that seems needlessly confusing, that's because it is. Don't worry too much about Rampage. The important part here is that cumulative upkeep cost. The first upkeep we have with the War Riders, we have to give an opponent a 1 1 survivor token. The turn after, we have to give away 2 survivors. The turn after that, 3 survivors. And. I considered running Barchild herself, but like, we don't even want the survivors. Alright, let's move on to this deck's toolboxes. If you haven't heard the term toolbox before in regards to deck building, it's pretty self explanatory. It refers to some limited tutor effect and the package of cards it can find. So if we start with our equipment toolbox, we have our two equipment tutors, Stoneforge Mystic and Steel Shaper's Gift, and the equipment that they can find, Lightning Greaves, Dark Steel Plate, Skull Clamp, and Sunforger. The Greaves and the Plate protect our commander. Skull Clamp is one of our aforementioned draw engines, and Sunforger gets all of its Sunforger things. Sunforger is a really cool equipment. Once it's equipped to a creature, we can pay a red and a white, unattach it, and search our library for a red or white instant with CMC 4 or less and cast it without paying its mana cost. We have a whopping 13 cards in this deck that we can cast with Sunforger. I've mentioned one already, Benevolent Offering. We have Spot Removal in Path to Exile, Chaos Warp, Return to Dust, Crush Contraband, and Lightning Helix. If you've never seen a Lightning Helix cast with Firesong and Sunspeaker in play before, it's really cool. Giving it lifelink means that it will create two instances of life gain, which triggers Firesong and Sunspeaker's second ability twice. In the end, we deal 9 and gain 6, which is just silly for a 2 mana instant. We have Counter Magic, that's right, Counter Magic, in Red Elemental Blast and Mage's Contest. 
We have Horde Protection with Boros Charm and Teferi's Protection. And a pretty spicy one in Brand, which I included in my deck because I feel like there are a lot of steel effects being played in my local playgroup. I wouldn't recommend Brand universally. We can also grab Pulse of the Fields if we need to gain some life, as it triggers Fire Song and Sunspeaker as well. Enlightened Tutor finds a lot of key cards in the deck, including Sunforger itself. The last card in our Sunforger package is Mistvel Plains. Obviously, we can't cast it off Sunforger as it's a land, but what it can do is put our instants on the bottom of our library, so we can get them with Sunforger again and again and again. Mistvel Plain leads us to our final toolbox, our non-basic lands. To search for them, we have Expedition Map and Weathered Wayfarer. One of our most important targets is Glacial Chasm. It can buy us the time we need to set up a Sunforger or Repercussion, and with the amount of life we can gain, its cumulative upkeep is rarely an issue. Care Keep and Forbidden Orchard were mentioned earlier. Scavenger Grounds provides some graveyard hate. The Seiju, who shelters all, allows us to cast our board wipes through counter magic, which is very important. There are many other non-basics in the deck, but they're not usually what we're tutoring for. Alright, we're almost done. Just a few more cards rounding out the deck. Ghostly Prison keeps us alive as the board fills up with creatures before we cast a big board wipe. Nihiri's Machinations can allow our commander to survive one of our big board wipes, though I can imagine cutting it one day. Survival Cash is a cute little card that, honestly, I should also probably cut, but I just love it so much, and if I don't play it in Firesong and Sunspeaker, where will I? And, of course, we have Vandal Blast. Just because we're overly reliant on artifacts doesn't mean we can't punish our opponents who are doing the same. And that, my friends, is the deck. It's still a work in progress. There are certainly many tweaks to be made in the future, and hopefully many new cards will be printed in the coming years that we can add to improve it. That's another cool thing about building this kind of deck. The people at Wizards of the Coast who make magic cards are aware of the power disparity between the colors and commander and are working to close the gap. We know this not just because some of those people are active on social media and have said as much, but also because we can look at this decklist's newest cards and see what they've been giving us. Smothering Tithe is the most obvious and recent example, but there is also Dawn of Hope, Neheb the Eternal, the Fairy's Protection, and Crush Contraband. This deck wouldn't have been possible just a few years ago. Its commander was only printed in Dominaria, which, as I'm recording this in January of 2019, is still under a year old. If you're watching this video, say, a year or even six months from now, I've probably made some new additions already, and I encourage you to check out the link to the current decklist in the video description below. It's for this reason that I like to keep track of what design space Wizards has been exploring in their newest sets. I can build commander decks that are more likely to get new goodies when the next set drops. For instance, building a commander deck all around Island Walk sounds cool, but I don't see new cards with Island Walk being printed anytime soon, so maybe not. Let me know in the comments if there's new design space being explored that's inspired you, or maybe has you thinking about building a new commander deck. Also, as usual, don't forget to like and subscribe. Thank you for watching this episode of the Commander Table. Till next time, go have fun.